And this is Jonah, chapter 3, verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, good morning. My name is Jim, one of the pastors here. It's good to have you. Welcome. Uh, Any tech fans in here? Just a few. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, I'm a Sparty, by the way, so thank you uh, for last night. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, I want to I talk about one quick thing before we, we continue in our study in the, the book of Jonah. Uh, we've got one more week, so it's been, been a short book, but it's been a good book, and so we'll keep going uh, th- this morning there. But one quick thing, and that's, uh, that's this. We, we started this church uh, eight years ago, for the most part, for two reasons. One, uh, so that people would see how big God is. We want people to see a big God who has big glory and big grace. And then second, uh, those that don't know that God yet would know that God, that, that people would meet Jesus, they would see how big he is, how big his glory is, how big his grace is. That's, that's why we started this church. And so if you're here and you're wrestling with what you believe about God, if you're still playing with some of the tensions of just maybe how you grew up, maybe you grew up in the church, but you, you walked away, you're not sure what your faith is, what you believe, we believe, we think, we try to be a place where, uh, 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 by place I mean a family, a people, where you can ask those questions, you can, you can figure out, you can continue to process uh, what you think about Jesus and what you're going to do with this whole Christianity thing. So we're glad that you're here. We want to be able to walk with you. Hopefully we are a safe place for you uh, in doing that. But here's the thing, when, when, when God saves somebody, um, when he rescues them, when he redeems them, when he, when he saves them, one of the first things that a Christian does is they get baptized. And it's one of those things that we, we celebrate. We love that here at the Paradise. That's a big deal to us. And we don't get to do it a lot because they don't let us do that. In the first year, we had a big tank of water. It was over there. We didn't tell them. Uh, just, you know, you know, figured we could apologize later. Um, and they found out. And, and so now we do them at the park. We do, uh, uh, you know, baptisms, Trinity Park, right across from Chewy's. So chips, salsa, baptisms. It's like heaven, okay? And, and so May 5th, that's what we'll do then. But here's the thing. If, you're, if that's you, like you, you, over the past few weeks, over the past few months, maybe the last year or so, you became a Christian. You put your trust in Jesus. Uh, we want you to go to the baptism class next week. We want you to uh, go there. We want you to learn more about what it means to be a Christian. Even if you're not sure, even if you're still wrestling with some things, ask those questions. Uh, let us help you with that. Uh, and, then, and then maybe even consider being baptized on May 5th. And we're going to sell them. And that's a big deal to us as a church. That, that's why we started this church, was uh, to have that conversation with you and to rejoice with you uh, across the street from Chewy's. Okay? So uh, love you for that. Want you to do that. Consider that. Uh, let's pray to that end. Let's pray for our time this morning, and we'll jump right back into Jonah. All right, so pray with me. Uh, Father, we do. We pray for those things. Uh, we pray that you would make us a people that is safe for our friends and family and neighbors, those of us that, uh, those of us that, that, that have friends that are, are wrestling and wondering and considering, and that we'd be a place where we can walk with them in the midst of that. We can... We can hear them out. Not that we know all the answers. We don't know all the answers. But we can keep putting before them this big God who has big glory and big grace. 
God, would you, would you do what you do? Would you, would you rescue and would you redeem? And would, would we get to hear those stories and rejoice? And so we thank you for that. Even this morning, we pray that as we all come in here, every one of us, Christian, not Christian, um, trusting in Jesus, not sure if we even believe in Jesus, as we walk into this place, would you meet us here? That as your word is open and, and the spirit of God is present and your people are here, that you would meet us in this place, that we would hear from you again and your word would do what it does and it would change our hearts. It would stir us to worship. Would you, would you do that? So help us. We... We confess that we're, we're not in here like just perfectly ready to hear you and completely understand it and completely change our lives. Like we can't do that apart from you. Those of us that have been a Christian for decades, those of us that may, maybe don't even know who you are, we all say that we need you. And so would you be gracious to us? And we have great expectation that you would as we pray in the, the big and strong and able and good name of Jesus in whom we pray. Amen. Amen, yeah. Um, we're going to talk about the deep things of God this morning. I want to talk about the deep things of God. And here's been my prayer and here's been my, my hope for us uh, th- this past week as I've considered our time together. And, and that's, that's that we would leave this place, like uh, all of us. I want all of us to leave this place with our soul soaring. That's my hope, right? No, no, nothing less than, than you and I, our hearts engaged, our mind engaged, worshiping God and in awe of the, the, this God that, we, that we've just met, the, the, the deep things of God that we've just um, met with. That, that's what I want, uh, I want for us this morning. We would leave here with our souls soaring. Okay? And there's some practices, there's some, there's some things that Christians do, and there's some responses to this big God that we're going to see in the text. We're going to continue to talk about evangelism because that's a big theme for us in Jonah, and we're going to talk about repentance because we get to see uh, uh, that play out as well. But all of that is connected to these deep things of God that we're also going to, to look at. So that's my hope, that we leave here in awe of God, Okay? No, no, nothing less than that. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll you know, pray with me as we go along that that happens in our hearts. But let me bring you up to speed on, on where we are in the story because uh, there's, there's been a lot happening uh, even, even in these first few uh, chapters of the book. And so I want to I catch you up uh, between this story of Jonah and Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. Assyria has been brutalizing and oppressing God's people, Jonah's people, right? So they are enemies, and yet God, he calls Jonah, he calls his prophet to go to Nineveh and to preach to them this message, and it's a message of judgment. We talked about that last week, that sometimes messages of judgment are also messages of grace. They're gracious warnings, and Jonah doesn't want to go. In fact, he'll tell us um, in, in the next chapter in, uh, uh, in, in verse 2 that like, he knows what God's going to do. He knows the character of God. He knows that God loves to show mercy, and so he doesn't want to go because he doesn't want God to forgive them. He doesn't want God to, to he, he wants God to crush them, and so he's not going to go, and so he rebels against God in chapter 1. He disobeys God's word, tries to run as far away from God as he can, right? We do that too. It's kind of funny. Um, Jonah does it. We do it, but we try to hide from God. And it's funny because it's like we're like my little three-year-old who tries to hide from me in my house when she's sinning, right? When she disobeys and she knows she's going to get disciplined, she tries to run away, and then she hides behind the curtain. Um, but it's my house. It's my curtain. I can see her feet sticking out of the curtain. Uh, that's how you are with God when you try to hide from God. That's how Jonah is too. And so he runs away from God, uh, gets on a ship, and uh, God finds him, sends a storm. Jonah knows the storm is from God, and that he's so distraught, he's so hard-hearted, he so does not want to see his enemies, the Ninevites, uh, 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 shown mercy that he, he just he would rather die. And so he tells the sailors, throw me overboard. And then, of course, the most famous part of this story, God miraculously saves Jonah in the belly of a fish, which isn't hard for a God who raised Jesus from the dead, created all things, does miracles all the time. So that's not a big deal. So he saves Jonah. Uh, Jonah experiences God's grace. Uh, 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 and, and, and now he's, he meets with God and now he's changed. Okay? Jonah has been changed by God, and so then in chapter 3, God calls him again to Nineveh, and this time he goes. 
Right? This time he obeys and he goes and he preaches this tough sermon on the judgment of God. And we left the story in verse 5 where it says that the greatest of the Ninevites and the least of them, they repent and they turn to God. And so this morning, this part of the story, we get to see their repentance play out and we can learn some things about it. Okay, so we can learn some things about evangelism here. We're going to learn some things about repentance here. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get into the nature and character of God. We'll dwell deep there. And I think there's something really neat for us to see. And it's going to do good work in our soul. Okay? So first thing, evangelism. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. There's a couple of things here I want us to see. In verse 6, it says, The word, right, the word of the Lord, that Nona, uh, Nona, Jonah, <laughs> Jonah, that Jonah preached, the word reached the king of Nineveh. Isn't that amazing? That Jonah's message reaches all the way to the most powerful person in the city, the most powerful person in this nation. It reaches the king. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it commands us to pray for those that are in power. That we're to pray for politicians and presidents. We're to pray for people in power that this would happen, that the word of God would reach them that the message of God would reach them. Whatever your politics are, the Bible commands us to pray for Trump. And we're to pray um, sometimes to this end that the word would reach all the way to the king. How amazing and wonderful it is that, that Jonah's sermon gets to the highest um, a person in the land. And so as we consider our own evangelism, like as we're seeking as a church to grow in that, the, the proclamation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to the, the, the friends and the family and the coworkers and, and people around us, as we consider that, um, and, and we're growing in this, consider this. The arm of the Lord is strong and his reach is far and there is nobody too far from God. There is nobody that is too far gone. Not the president, not the most vitriolic opponent to Christianity that there is, not your atheist friend. There is nobody that is outside of the, the, the reach of the grace of God. Nobody. The Apostle Paul was the most uh, uh, terrible opponent to the early church, and, and Jesus meets him, knocks him off his horse, saves him, and the Apostle Paul becomes the best church planner the world has ever known and writes most of the New Testament. Nobody you know, nobody you know is outside of the grace of God. The arm of the Lord is strong, his reach is far, the gospel can save anybody can save anybody. In fact, it's interesting to think of some of the people in power in recent history uh, that, that, that God has saved. Uh, so there's been a few presidents that uh, actually practiced Christians, actually were Christians. They didn't just say they were because they wanted to be voted, uh, voted in. Uh, and so you had a couple of presidents, Jimmy Carter, William McKinley, uh, uh, of course, everyone's favorite, George Dub, right? W. W, loved the Lord. Uh, obviously, a bunch of famous athletes uh, are, are believers. They're Christians, but maybe the most obvious one and the fourth member of the Trinity, Tim Tebow. Anyone? <laughs> right? Got to praise Jesus for Tebow. Right? You got Tebow. There's been some cool conversions in the music industry. You've got Johnny Cash. You've got Bob Dylan. You've got the, uh, the front man for corn, whatever his name was. What's his name? That guy. <laughs> that guy. Yeah, we know what kind of music you listen to. Uh, Hollywood, Hollywood's a little bit tougher, man. We got some work to do, okay? Here's, here's all, all I think we have with Hollywood. Gary Busey and Stephen Baldwin. Um, I think that's all we got. And so we have some work to do there. But the grace of God is far-reaching. Right? It is far-reaching. No one is too far gone. No one is too far gone. Here's the other thing that I think is interesting in the story of Jonah in regards to evangelism, not just here in chapter 3, but really the whole story. Um, who are the people in, in this story that respond to God, that obey God, that worship God? And then who is the one who, who disobeys God? Isn't that interesting? Because it was the sailors, the pagan sailors, the non-believers in chapter 1 who, 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 who they fear God and they call out his name. And it's the Ninevites in chapter 3, from the greatest to the least, who, who respond to God, who call out his name mightily, pray to him mightily, who repent to him. And it's Jonah, it's the believer, it's the Christian, it's the prophet who disobeys God. 
All of it in response to the word of God. Jonah disobeys God's word. The pagan, non-Christian, non-believing, uh, you know, atheists or, 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 or agnostics of that day, they respond to God. They obey to God's word. All of it is response to God's word. Everybody responds to God, God's word. This morning, everyone in here will respond to God's word. You will either obey it or you will disobey it. You will accept the message of the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, or you will reject it. But every one of us will respond to the word of God. And what's interesting in this story, it's all the non-Christians that respond to God, and it's the Christians that disobey his word. And so because of that, consider this. Are you giving God's word, God's message, a chance? Like, what if your friends, what if your family, they are ready? Like, they're ready to hear and obey and worship, but you're not. You're not obeying God's word to send you. You're not obeying God's word for you to speak it. Like, what if they're ready? What if they're ready to obey, but you're not? Make, may that not be true about us. Right? May that not be true about the Paradox Church, that we disobey God. Like Jonah, we disobey God's word. All the while, our friends and family and neighbors are ready to hear it. They're ready. The gospel can save anybody, man. There's nobody too far gone. Jesus, he, he says that we should pray for laborers to go out because the harvest is ready. He, he doesn't even say we should pray for those to be saved. He prays or says we should pray for our own hearts that we would go. He's ready to save. And maybe they're ready to obey and worship God. I think we're tempted to withhold the clear proclamation of the gospel sometimes, of, of sharing the gospel. Um, we're, we're tempted to withhold it, and we'll say things like this. Like, we'll say things like, I'm just, I'm just going to love them. I'm just going to love them. I'm not going to try to put my faith on my family member or put my faith on my friend. Like, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to push. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to love them as if it's your love that saves and not God's love that saves. Or maybe like, like me, like I feel like I have a tendency to do this where I'll, I'll, like, I'll, I'll try to like nuance and, and just in this kind of witty way, like, like bring about, uh, 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 you know, here's the way the world and culture is at work, but here's how the idea of Christianity can, 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 is the answer to all of that. And I'll just, I'll be able to nuance and wit, like I'll just be, like my words are going to save and not God's word. As if I can just convince them because I'm, I've read books, you know with footnotes and there's no pictures in them. As if my word saves and not God's word saves. No, God's word saves. God's love saves. We're just the messenger. We need to get out of the way and just do what he called us to do, to obey his word because I wonder if they're ready to obey his word too. Yeah. And so as we see some of the deep things of God later, let his bigness and let let what stirs you to worship him as we walk out of the doors this morning also embolden you to be bold in your proclamation of who he is to the people that maybe don't know him. Here's the other, here's the other way in which maybe we need to respond today, and that's repentance. Okay, so look at verse 6 again. It's interesting. We get to, we get to learn about repentance from these Ninevites. Verse 6, it says, The word reached the king of Nineveh. He, he gets up from his throne and he's going to remove his robe. He takes off his robe. He covers himself with sackcloth, and he sits in ashes. This is repentance. Sackcloth and ashes, they're a symbol of grief. They're a symbol of regret. They're a symbol of, of repentance. There's a posture here that we can learn from. We can, we can learn from the posture of this pagan king who is now responding God, to God for the first time. And here, here's, here's some things that we can learn. First, our heart must be repentant, okay? So the king, he takes off his royal robe. This is his robe of power. This is his, his very identity. This is his wealth. This is his influence. He takes off his royal robe and he puts on sackcloth and he sits in ashes. There's a physical posture here that is connected to his heart. Okay, so our physical posture, like what we do, we're holistic holistic beings. That's how God made us. And so, uh, for example, why, we, why Christians raise their hands when they worship. Right? We raise our hands when we worship, and the Psalms tell us to lift our hands when we sing to Jesus because there's a connection between your physical posture and your heart. 
And so sometimes like our heart is in, man, like we're in awe of God. We want to sing to God. And so we can't help but lift our hands, open our hands, Baptist like right here, you know, okay. Presbyterians, just like, just there. Okay. It's fine. We love you. It's fine. And, and, and so, man, we're in, right? We're in. Must be Presbyterian. We're not so in. Okay. But we're in. And, and, but sometimes, sometimes our heart isn't there. And the lifting of our hands, our physical posture can connect with our heart. Our physical posture can lead us into that heart posture of worship. Same thing with repentance, right? We can, we can posture ourselves in a humble way. There's a way in which we can be physically that hopefully will lead to a, a repentance of the heart. But at some point, there has to be a repentance of the heart. We can't just say with our words or look like outwardly that we're sorry or that we're repentant, but there has to be a true repentance in the heart. This is the, 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 the kind of the juxtaposition the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Corinthians, where he talks about godly grief and worldly grief. Right, just external sorrow and repentance or, or the actual repentance of the heart. And the actual repentance of the heart is being sorrow over your, having, having sorrow over your sin and, and, and you're broken over it. And man, I've sinned against God and he, this God loves me and I've, I've disobeyed him. God, I am so sorry. Like it's a true repentance. And Paul says that kind of repentance leads to life. But the, 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 the worldly grief, the, the kind of not real repentance, maybe more of the just outward lookings of repentance, he says that's a worldly sorrow that leads to death. That's where you're just sorry about that you got caught. You're just sorry because of the, the consequences now of your sin. You're not really sorry about the sin. You're sorry that, that there's consequences to your sin. That's not a true repentance. There needs to be a true repentance of the heart, and that sometimes is even seen in the physical posture that we might have. The tone of our voice, our humility, our, our posture towards maybe the person that we're repenting to. Okay? First thing, we have a repentant heart. Second is in verse 7 and verse 8, where the king, he issues a proclamation, then he says, let everyone, let everyone turn that's repentance. You turn, turn from sin, turn to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way. So the king is now using his power. He's using his influence to lead his people in repentance. And it's their repentant hearts that lead to repentant acts. Repentance, true repentance also has acts of repentance. Jesus calls it the, the bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. What it means is we'll do whatever it takes to make amends. We're, we're by God's grace going to change now. That's true repentance. We don't just say it. We're going to work towards now changing. Baby, I've, oh man, I, just, I haven't had you on my radar and, and, and I, I haven't paid much attention to you. I've been very selfish with, with my focus and my time and, my, and, and, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to love you well. I want to serve you. Will you forgive me? Friend, I mean, I've been bitter towards you. I've been unforgiving towards you. And because of that, I think I've distanced myself from you. I'm sorry. Like, that's wrong for me to do. I'm going to truly forgive you, and I'm not going to separate myself. I'm going to re-engage in this relationship. Will you forgive me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God, I, I, in my sorrow or in my hurt or in my tiredness, I've escaped towards other things, and I've not run to you. I'm drinking too much. I'm watching too much TV. I'm escaping. Will you forgive me? I repent of that. And now in my, in my tiredness, in my stress, I'm going to run to you in that. I'm going to pray to you. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to go to you. We, we actually have repentant acts. We don't just talk about our sorrow. We don't just talk about our sin. We do something. We act in true repentance. The third thing that we see is in verse 7. Verse 7, it says that um, uh, there's this sort of repentant sacrifice where the king says, let neither man nor beast, uh, herd nor flock, taste anything. This is a, a financial sacrifice here. This is a halting of all business transactions. This is, this is no, more, no, more, no more business, no more industry. There's a, there's a stoppage, a fasting of all of that because when we're truly repentant, nothing else matters. We'll, we'll do whatever it takes. We'll sacrifice whatever it means in order to reconcile. 
Okay? This is repentant sacrifice, meaning um, th- this would be the husband who's willing to stop golfing or stop hunting because he- he's, he's recognized that he's sinned against his family and he's not spent enough time with them. And so he's going to sacrifice those things. He loves to do those things. Those things are important to him, but he's not going to. This is the mom who fasts from the iPhone because she wants to spend more time or focus more attention on the kids. This is a Christian that reorganizes their weekends and reschedules their life so that they can gather with the saints on Sundays more or be a part of serving the local body more. And so they're going to shape or reshape their life and their schedule around that. They're willing to sacrifice, uh, even if it means a hit to the, 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 the budget or a hit to the uh, to, you know, things that they want to do, their calendar, they're going to do whatever it takes. That's, that's because there's sacrificial repentance. When we're truly repentant, we'll sacrifice. The fourth thing is in verse 8. This is repentant prayer, where the king says, and let them, let everybody, call out mightily to God. This is repentant prayer. When we truly repent, we turn to God and we pray. We pray. We'll just kind of play it out in our own heads and feel sorry for ourselves. We turn to God in our sin. And they call out mightily to God. So this isn't, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have sinned. I mean, you know, you know, you know, forgive me. Right? That's not, that, they're calling out mightily to God. God, I sinned against you. I sinned against the holy God who has shown me so much grace. Thank you, God, that you have more grace for me because I have sinned. Help me. Help me to be obedient to you, to choose you as a greater joy And then there's a sweetness to this repentant prayer. Like, we get to pray. In our sin, we get to talk to God. He won't reject you. He's not going to yell at you. He's going to hear you. When we sin, when we mess up, we can call our dad. True repentance prays, and it's a beautiful thing that we get to go to the Father when we sin. And then finally, there's this this repentant patience in verse 9. The king, he says, who knows, who knows, God may, key word, may, God may turn and relent. So true repentance isn't entitled. God's not obligated to do this. True repentance is patient. You're not going to pressure people to forgive you. You're not going to pressure them to reconcile right, right now with you. You're not, you're, not, you're not pressuring them to do it. You have no sense of entitlement. You're going to spend as much time as necessary um, talking it out. You're going to spend as much time as necessary hearing them out with, man, here's what you did, and here's how that made me feel, and here's, here, man, that hurts, and, and you're willing to hear that out, and you're not going to pressure them to forgive you. Okay, so like 15 years in, this is what I'm struggling with with, with my wife, with Heather, Okay. 15 years in, I want to say I'm sorry, and then I feel like that should be it. I feel like we should be done. Like, I think we're done now, and, and, but we're not. We're not done, and we shouldn't be done because what's that, what, what that, that's revealing is that I'm not really truly repentant. It means that I care more about the reconciliation than I do about her heart. And true repentance is patient. It will wait. It will talk. It will figure it out. Right? We're not going to pressure We're not going to defend ourselves. True repentance is not entitled. It is not entitled. And so true repentance, it's a mark of a Christian. It's a big deal. This is a regular practice of the Christian. We speak of repentance as joyful repentance because we get to turn to God. He gives us more and more grace. We get to turn from sin and turn to God. That's a greater joy, a greater, it's a better choice to make. And so this is a big deal. And we can turn to God because it's the kindness of God and the goodness of God and the nature and character, the deep things of God uh, that, 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 that not only make it necessary for us to repent, but also that we can do that with freedom and joy. In fact, um, God tells us in Joel chapter 2, just kind of wraps all this up in just a couple of verses. It's really neat. He says this in Joel chapter 2, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? Yeah. 
And so the way that this, this non-believing pagan king responds to the message of God is it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me that we can learn repentance from this this non-Christian king that meets God for the first time, and yet it shows how consistent and how powerful God's word is if we give it a chance, if we give it a chance. Now, let's see, let's see how God responds. This is verse 10. This is where we get to get into the deep things of God, and, and this is fascinating to me. Verse 10, this is just, I love, I, love, I love this, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it, okay? Love this God. I love this God. You you ever, like, uh, learn some of the ins and outs of something, and once you do, it just becomes more compelling to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, you learn about something in a way they just didn't understand. It's the human body, and you learn something about how the human body functions, maybe, or it's Photoshop and design, and you're like, oh, that's cool. I can't believe they can do that, or it's just something, right? It doesn't matter. It's business principles. I mean, it could be anything, but you, you read the book, you learn the science, you learn the math, you watch the YouTube video, and you get some of the ins and outs of, of something, and you get a deeper level of it, and you just have a deeper appreciation of it. Have you ever had that? I think that same thing happens with God, but at a cosmic level, at a worship level, at an eternal level, when we get into the deep things of God, it can do at that greater level such a good work in our hearts and can stir us to worship to where I think we can walk out of here today with our soul soaring uh, if we can see this, okay? And so here's what's happening, okay? Some of your translations in verse 10, they're going to say, depending on what, which one you have, they're going to say uh, that God repented, right? God repented of the disaster that he said he would. But the ESV translation here is the right one, and it's conveying uh, what's going on in the heart and mind of, of God here. God relents, okay? So our God is relentless in his pursuit of his people, and he also relents his judgment from his people. He's going to show mercy, right? He relents. And Jonah knew this would happen. Jump down to chapter 4, verse 2. Jonah knew this was going to happen. That's why he didn't want to go. And so he says, he prays to the Lord in, 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 in chapter 4, verse 2, Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my own country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Okay, Jonah knew God would do this. And so some people, they read this, they read that God relented, that God, um, you know, he changed his mind, pastor. God changed his mind. God said he was gonna, he was gonna kill all these fools and now he says he's not. So God changed his mind. They, he responded to, to, to the people. Is, is that what's happening? No, not really. And what is happening, there's a depth and a beauty and a mystery to it that is fascinating. It's wonderful. Here's what's happening. What's happening in verse 10 is that you have, you've got the eternal God who is outside of time, right? He's outside of time. He, he's outside of the past, the present, and the future, and he stands outside of time. He's not hindered by time, and he's purposing all things, right? Everything that he's doing in time, he's doing for the glory of Jesus and the good of his people, okay? And so he's doing that. He knows the end from the beginning. Nothing surprises him, and he's outside of time, and he steps into time and place in verse 10. In verse 10, he enters time and place, and instead of showing judgment, his purposes were that he would show mercy. He's going to act in time and place and show grace, okay? The book of Jeremiah tells us that he would do this. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, it says this. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom like Nineveh, that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. And so God isn't changing his mind here. He's accomplishing his purposes. That's all that God is doing in verse 10. And in the economy of God, and God doesn't have to do this. He's not obligated to do this. He doesn't always do this. He just loves to do this. In the economy of God, his mercy triumphs judgment. God's mercy is greater than his judgment. And so in time and place, God acts with mercy on the people of Nineveh. God didn't change his mind here. God wasn't surprised at what happened. He wasn't wondering. 
Okay? It wasn't like God is like on his throne in heaven looking down at Nineveh and he's like, man, I wonder what they're going to do. How are they going to respond? Nineveh loves me. Nineveh loves me not. They love me. They love me not. Oh, wait. No, he's not surprised. He's not on the edge of his seat. He's not waiting to see what they do. The unchanging, huge God of the universe is working out his purposes on these people and nothing will stop him. Nothing will stop him. There's something called the immutability of God. And what that means is that, is that God never changes, okay? God never changes. It's his immutability. He's unchanging. And it's one of the most beautiful realities of God as you begin to think about it. Its applications to your life are, are, are they're, they're unbelievable. But here's some examples about what that means that God does not change. Uh, for, for example, uh, who he is doesn't change. So his very person, the person of God doesn't change. James 1 Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He doesn't change. He loves to give good gifts. Every good gift you get is from him. He ain't changing. He's going to keep giving you good gifts. God doesn't change. He doesn't change um, what he says. Like, who, who, what he says doesn't change. His very promises will not change. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? God's promises do not change. Okay? What he's doing doesn't change. His purposes don't change. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purposes. God does not change. The New Testament says that, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has no beginning. He has no end. He does not change. Everything else, everyone else is temporary, finite, fragile, but God is not. God is not. He's always been good. He's always been perfect. He's always been powerful. He's always been gracious. He's always been loving. He's always been all of those things all of the time. He never grew in those things. He never had to develop in those things. He never increased in those things. There was never a different degree to those things. He was always perfect in all of his perfections, perfectly every time, all the time. God has never needed to change. He does not change. He will not change. He always is. He always will be. He always was. God doesn't have bad days. He never wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. God does not change. And think about it. Everyone around you changes. God doesn't change, but everyone else around you changes. Yeah? Like you put your trust in a leader and they change, they fail you, and then you're disappointed. Uh, you, you ever have like a friend, like all of a sudden get a bunch of money or become famous and all of a sudden they change, usually for the worse, and they've changed. Or your spouse, they're kind, they're understanding to you one week, the next week you're like, who, are, who did I marry, who is this? They changed. Or your friends, they change, your kids change all the time. Everyone around you changes, and because everyone around you changes, you can't completely trust them, can you? You're not completely safe, are you? It's always why you feel a little unsettled. You feel a little unsure because you don't know, even those closest to you at any given moment, how they might respond or react to you. You don't know because they change. You don't know. You could be vulnerable to them. You could be known by them. You could hand them your sword and they could defend you with it or they could hurt you with it. You don't really know. So you're not totally safe. You can't fully and completely trust because everybody changes. You change. You change. One day, man, you love God. The next day, you feel far from God. Experiences pile up. They begin to shape you. Hurts and feelings begin to pile up in your heart. And from one day to the next, you may not even know who you are. Everyone changes. But God doesn't change. God doesn't change. There's something else called the impassibility of God, and it's connected to God's unchangingness. It's called this impassibility, and what it means is that God can't be changed. So God doesn't change, but he also can't be changed by us, okay? And so there's, there's, there's a, a complexity to this, but, but what it means is that he's without passions. 
And it's not that he's without emotions or he's without affections. It just means there's a complexity to the emotions of God and an infinite God is going to be hard for us to fully grasp and understand. But in his emotions, what it means is that he's not subject to humanity. In God's feelings, in his drive, in his passions, in his desires, he's not subject to your, uh, uh, your actions, what you do. Meaning his mood is not tossed to and fro because of something you do or say. Your actions can't change God's mood. He's never going to fly off the handle. God never has written an email that he regrets sending. That's never happened to God. He has the perfect mix of steadiness and emotion. Right? He's not distant and cold and hard, but he's also not hyper-emotional and flippant and flaky. He's perfect in his emotions, and he's um, uh, unassailed in his emotions. There's nothing that we can do to change them. He has feelings. He has emotions. He gets angry. He'll get sad. He will even rejoice, but nothing happens. Nothing you or I do changes him. And so what you do can't change him. He won't change. He's immutable. He's unchanging. Everything else changes, but not God. But then some of you might say, well, look at verse 10 though, Jim. Like I'm I'm still reading it and it says when, when God saw what they did, he relented. It seems like he's responding to us. It seems like he's reacting to us. I get that God is unchanging, but what do we do with verses like that? And I want to make this so clear to you because it's hard. It's hard to make clear, but it's also so important and beautiful to, to, to see this God, like who God is, is this is stunning if we can get it. But we have to do, we have to ask that question. Like, what do we do with verses like this? It seems like God is responding to us. It seems like we're acting upon him. It seems like he's reacting to us. What do we do with verses like verse 10? Where it seems like he changes according to the behavior of his people. Or think of about some other things. Like, what about prayer? Like, why pray if we can't move the hand of God? Why would we pray if that doesn't change the mind or heart or or, or, or hand of God. Like, what? why pray? What do we do with things like Genesis 6, where it says that, that God, God says he's grieved at our sin and he regrets making us? It seems to be moving upon him. What do we do with the places in the Old Testament where it says that God remembered somebody? God remembered Noah. God remembered Rachel. Like, what's happened? Did he forget them? Like, what's he doing there? All of a sudden, God's like, oh, there's Noah. I should do something. What do we do with texts like that, with those kinds of things? So God's impassibility, it means that God, he's not vulnerable to us, right? That God's not at risk with us. We, we, okay, I think, I think we explained that. That we can't hurt God is what it means, unless. Unless he wills that we do. Unless God wants to be hurt by us. Unless God wants to be grieved by us. Unless God wants to open himself up to betrayal. Will that occur? God has so bound his heart to his people. God has so tied his heart to us that, that, that his, his love has been set on us that he allows himself to be betrayed by us. makes it all the more amazing because that means that God grieves and God suffers over you and your relationship with him because he wants to. Because he wants to. God has so bound himself to his people that the eternal God acts in real time. This is the nearness of the transcendent God, right? This is this huge God of the universe who's outside of time, enters into time, enters into place, and meets with you there. And when he meets with you there, he opens himself up to the relationship. He feels with you. He sees with you. He'll grieve with you in the grief. Because in time and place, he meets with his people. Jesus is the, of course, exact picture of this. What what is really hard to capture in our mind or understand in our minds, we can see in Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, as the eternal son of God, leaves heaven behind, leaves the eternal heaven, enters into time and place, enters into human history, 
opens himself up, makes himself vulnerable, allows himself to be betrayed, to be hurt, to be judged. Jesus comes into time and space and enters into that with us. Nineveh, God can relent of its judgment on Nineveh because Jesus bound his heart to his people, tied himself to his people, was judged for his people. And so God can relent of his judgment on Nineveh. And some of you would say, well, but, but Jesus hadn't died yet. Like, how, how can God save Nineveh? How can God save Nineveh, Nineveh according to Jesus? Or, or God, how does God save the people in the Old Testament according to Jesus? Like, how is King David a Christian? How is, how is Noah a Christian? Like, how are these people saved when Jesus hasn't died yet? Well, it's because he's outside of time. He's not restrained by time. The eternal God is not constrained by minutes and seconds and hours. He's not waiting for something to happen. He's not hindered by that. He's huge. He's immutable, unchanging, impassable, won't change, but he binds his heart to his people and he meets us where we are. He meets us where we are. He's huge and he's near. Like, come on. This is how I know the God of the Bible is the only one true God. We can never draw up a God like this. We can never imagine a God like this that is this big, this strong, and yet this near and this good. And so here, here's what that means for you. Everyone around you and everything around you is changing, but God doesn't. Everyone around you is still becoming, but God just is. God is steady. God won't change. God is the only safe place. And so listen, only in him will you ever find rest. Only in him will you ever truly be safe. Only in the unchanging one can you fully trust and be known. Only in him. He doesn't change. He's the only safe place. And so when you're alone, you can go to, you can go to God because you, you, can, you can find friendship there. He's never going to reject you. He doesn't change. You're never going to catch him on a bad day. When you sin, you can go to God and you can be assured that you'll find grace. He doesn't change. You can repent, truly repent, and go to God because he's safe. He does not change. When he calls us to this, this work of evangelism, when he calls a church to grow and to be bolder in our proclamation of the goodness and grace and bigness of God, we can go. We can go with boldness and proclaim this big, complex, beautiful God because he doesn't change. He has always saved. He will save. And he'll save even right now. There's people ready right now to hear the message of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus who enters into time and place to save for himself a people. We just have to go and say it. He's huge and he's near. That's the God of Jonah. It's the God of Nineveh. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the God of Fort Worth. It's the God of the president. It's the God of the politicians. It's the God of people in power. And he's your God too. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that this is true, that you've done this, that you are this big, that you are this near, that I thank you that you're a God that we can't fully grasp that we can't put in a box, that we can't fully understand. And yet would you, would you try to take these, these truths? Um, God, that I, I confess, I, I imperfectly put forward. Would you, would you seal them to our hearts in a way that we would not only know, maybe even understand, maybe even believe, that we would send our souls soaring. We'd be in awe of how good you are, how big you are. Would you do this? Even now as we respond to you personally, would you show us the things that you're calling us to turn from? The things that maybe we've not We've not obeyed. 
would you speak to us even now? Would you enter into time and place even right now to speak to our hearts? And so let me just help you with that. Let me lead us in a time of response as you go before the Lord. What is that thing? That thing that, that maybe you, you feel weighed down by? Maybe it's sin? Maybe it's that, that relationship that you just don't feel completely safe in? What's the thing that's just burdening you right now? And the Lord probably just stirred that up in your hearts as we were talking. And so just whatever that is, will you name it, confess it, and put that before God? Would you put that before him? Would you believe that he's safe? Would you believe that he will hear you? Would you believe that he, you haven't caught him on a bad day? Your actions haven't changed his, his posture towards you? And now maybe, maybe you trust him but maybe you don't. If you trust him, would you just keep talking to him? Would you, would, you, would you hear from him? Would you Would you be comforted by him? If you don't, would you just tell him that? Like, God, I don't know if I'm resonating with, with this. Maybe I even hear it and understand it, but I don't know if I believe. Would you tell him that? And so I just want you to have freedom to do that right now, just to kind of stay before the Lord. And then when you're ready, if you're a Christian, I want you to come forward. I want you to take of communion as we always do. No hurry. This is whenever you're ready. Complete freedom here. You'll take of the bread, which represents the body of Christ broken for you. You'll dip it into the wine or the juice, which represents the shed blood of Jesus for you. And you'll eat and you'll drink and you'll remember the unchanging, eternal God of all things entered into time and place, opened himself up to betrayal and hurt, judgment. Died on a cross for you, for you not obeying God, for you not obeying his word. You can take of it and you can remember that his love for you because of that will not change. It is finished. Your relationship with God will not change. Your position before him will not change. When you eat and you drink, you remember that this is why his death, his blood is why I've been reconciled to God. That won't change. And then you'll go back to your seat and we'll continue to pray and sing and, and respond to God. If you're not a Christian, uh, you honor us by just watching. Please just observe as we eat and as we drink. But our hope would be that you would recognize that what we need, and that's the grace of God, displayed in the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, is what you need too, and that it's free for you, it's there for you. We would ask that you would repent and turn to Jesus too. And then if you do, please come and join us at this family meal. Let's respond together to God.